The Toten Pairs podcast is brought to you by Toten Pairs, the full service agency that designs and markets products, services, and experiences for women. You can find out more about us online at totenpairs.com or on social at Toten Pairs. You're listening to the Toten Pairs podcast, where every other week we're bringing together industry experts, scholars, and creatives to explore how the many lenses a woman wears shapes her perspective. Tune in every other week for an intersectional perspective. So many people feel like you can't possibly be happy, you know, with this situation. This is every parent's worst nightmare. But then I just feel, no, you know, I have a child. This is my son. I'm Amber Anderson. And on today's show, we're talking about having it all with author and professor Marie Mungyung Lee. Thanks to Anne-Marie Slaughter, the phrase having it all has become synonymous with the conversation about women in work. And for good reason. For many years, many women were prevented from pursuing education and career opportunities. Instead, they were expected to stay behind and care for the kids. What was merely a dream for some female baby boomers is now an expectation for their daughters, millennial women, who are now responsible for over 80% of all births in the United States. However, as a new generation of women enter motherhood, many of them are approaching the transition differently than their predecessors, raising questions about what it means to be a mother have a career, and ultimately, live a fulfilling and meaningful life. Several people have jumped on board the conversation, offering tips like lean in or drop the ball and catchy phrases like girl boss. But beyond the catchphrases are real opportunities to meet women where they are, many of whom are looking for more meaning, more purpose, and more space to grow into their role as a mother. I know because I was one of those women. After the premature birth of my son, I quit work in search of more spaces to grow and heal. It was on this search that I found award-winning author and Columbia professor Marie Mungunk Lee and her piece, What My Son's Disabilities Taught Me About Having It All in the Atlantic. If Anne-Marie Slaughter's piece awakened the nation about the challenges women face in the work environment, Marie's piece will give you a glimpse into the soul of a mother looking for meaning beyond a catchphrase. Well, what was the first thought that ran through your mind when you found out you were pregnant? Where were you and and you finally got it and and how did that feel? What went through your mind? Well, because I'd had a bunch of miscarriages earlier, it wasn't the movie scene, yay, look at the, you know, the two stripes. Mm. For me, and I tend to be a very anxious person, I just felt, oh, is this going to work again? Do, you know, is my thyroid okay? So we were very cautiously anxious, uh, both of us, uh, because basically I'd gotten pregnant a couple of times and it didn't last. And so then when it lasted past the three month part. And I think probably when we saw, I decided not to do prenatal testing, uh, but we did do, uh, I guess what's called like a level two ultrasound. So when we first saw, you know, the, the fetus, I don't even know if he was a fetus then, but the thing that swims around (laughs) that, you know, it just became very real to us that yes, we do have a baby coming. Yeah. Yeah. And in your, in Labor Day, the book, you mentioned that you had midwives that you were working with. And unfortunately, when you came to go into labor, you ended up going um, to work with a midwife that you had never seen before. You call her Jenny. Yes. In the book. You remember Jenny? Yes. So I'd been with this midwife whom I loved and then, but then suddenly there's a complete stranger from, not even from this practice. She's just this new person from Harvard Health and was not, and you know, in that particular day, there happened to be a bunch of other women in labor. So she just looked so cranky, you know, that I was in labor and that I was having pain. And I also noticed her hair got messier as the day went on. I mean, I have empathy for her, but at the same time, you know, I had a really scary, precipitous birth. And just to not have someone familiar saying, this is normal, this is okay. And especially, she did not say, this is normal, this is okay. She, she was all worried, but then half of it was just go home because I'm too busy. Uh oh, come back. And I had no idea what was going on. And of course, my husband had no idea what's going on. And our doula didn't make it in time. So I had no one to guide me. My mother wasn't there. And she was heavily sedated for all her births. So she wouldn't have any idea what was going on either. 
there's a piece in Labor Day where you have in your essay, you say, you know, Jenny had come in with her hair even more disheveled, (laughs) that grim, annoyed look on her face, concurring with the nurse that indeed I had to get ready to push. I thought we would do one of the baby friendly positions, maybe a squat to be aided by gravity, but she had me in the the old OB's lithium position, flat on my back while she attached a fetal monitor, stuck a hand up my vagina and scratched the poor baby's head to see if it elicited a pain reaction. Speaking of which, I had reached that threshold of pain where I realized if I had a gun, I would have shot myself just to make it stop. I'm a very reserved person. And at some point, I just started yelling my head off because I was in so much pain. And then someone said something like, could you stop? It's going to scare the other patients. And I just remember just thinking, like I was having an out-of-body experience. It wasn't even me screaming because if it was, I would be so self-conscious I wouldn't do it. So you're in this pain, and then what happens next? You say in your essay about there being a lot of blood, and you start to hear um, all of the people start to enter into the room. Yes. I I had a feeling of my socks being wet, which I found out later was because they were soaked in blood. And I just kept hearing people going, oh, there's a lot of blood. Ooh, that's a lot of blood. Of course, not to me. But then, and then they kept saying, oh, the FH is is falling, the FH is falling, which I finally figured out was the fetal heartbeat. But but it was one of these things too, where it wasn't that, oh, your baby, or this is what's happening. It was completely like I'm some kind of birthing machine yeah. and I'm outside the entire process. Yeah. Yeah. And then what did happen? The baby came out? Well, sort of. It was – so Ginny – basically said, you know, baby's in trouble. And and I do remember someone bringing in a vacuum extractor as well. And she just said, you have to push the baby out. We didn't know if it was him or her right now. So all I remember doing is just massively just, I just, he just came shooting out. um, And that's why my whole perineum blew out. He just came shooting out after, I think, just a couple pushes. Mm -hmm. But then... I just remember he was be, he was kind of purple and then but they were so worried about what I'm not sure what they were worried about because I know now that even if a baby's purple when they come out I mean a lot of babies are purple apparently um, and they will pink up but they just clipped the cord right away took them away and we're doing all this stuff and I was just in so much pain and my husband you know we were just both kind of crying because we didn't know what had happened and all those things were beeping and we didn't know if he was okay so it just became this very weird. Uh, downward spiral for which also then when they brought him back, you know, we tried to bond, but, you know, I was in so much pain and then my milk didn't come in and he was hungry and then I didn't know, you know, what I was supposed to do. And at one point they said, oh, because I said, maybe I should go see the lactation consultant because my milk's not coming in. And they said, well, you have to walk over here to do blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I can't, I literally can't walk after yeah. something like that happened to me. And so, you know, also my other, you know, problem that I had is I didn't know what my rights were as a patient. Mm -hmm. Um, Apparently, you do have a right to see a lactation consultant, like under our health plan. And so I could have just said, look, I have this right. So make the person come here and see, you know, if the baby's latching on and so forth. But for me, I was still, I don't know what's going on. And this is new. And I'm just a newbie. And everyone else knows what's happening. So I'm just literally letting everything happen to me. What happened after you had your son? Because you mentioned in the essay that he has delays and you weren't sure whether the delays came from his birth or if they were just um, something else. Tell us about life after the birth. Well, so much of it is we actually don't know. And since birth, you know, first he had jaundice, you know, which can be pretty normal. He did have some colic and he had some really bad gastrointestinal problems, which involved diarrhea and crying. He had a lot of ear infections. And then when he was 18 months old, he started to walk a little bit funny, but not enough that his pediatrician was worried or even my mother, who tends to be more paranoid than I am, if that's possible. And... Then we started this just odd odyssey where it turned out that he had a semi-cancerous, I guess, tumors can be half cancerous and half not, um, tumor on his spinal cord. And then he needed all these operations that were very drastic and needed to have his spine fused. And But then after the operations, he just kind of 
his whole personality changed and he's he was crying all the time and his gut got really really bad and so uh, it kind of went on and off and then when he was three he was diagnosed with autism and so that is kind of the general way I guess they try to describe uh, his disabilities but there are other things that he has you know the he has uh, the gut problems. Um, he has sensory problems. Uh, there, are, there's a host of things that don't quite fit under that category. But yes, he is cognitively delayed. He has very many challenges, and and we don't know if he will continue to on this trajectory where he may not be independent or not. And one of the ways that I came in contact with you is, like I mentioned, I, I got the book Labor Day, but I actually um, fell in love with you because you wrote a piece for The Atlantic. You've written several, but the one that really caught me was what my son's disabilities taught me about having it all. Um, do you remember that piece? You wrote it a while ago. Well, what's funny is since you write as well, you might be interested to know that piece was rejected almost everywhere. But what's funny is so many people, even people who don't have children, someone brings it up at least once a month, even now. So yes, I do remember it very well. Really? Yeah. So you wrote it. It it was published July 30th, 2012. The top of it, it says, you know, because of her child's problems, the author will never have a tidy, peaceful life. But none of this keeps her from being happy as long as she asks herself the right questions. One of the questions has been, oh, wait, how do I do this? And I was realizing it's not about having it all. It's about being present at whatever I'm doing at that moment, one at a time. So in terms of quantity, it means much less. But in terms of experience, it's wonderful. And do you say that that has changed because of your experiences as a mother? Yes. And I will say um, there's sort of two things. One is... One of the reasons I'm really enjoying talking to you is I do feel like when people go through some very dire sort of experience, it does change them in a way that we recognize people that that's happened to. Do you know what I'm saying? I feel like I just can relate to people who've gone through just super catastrophic circumstances um, in a way because it just so changes you. And when you're talking about, you know, how can I talk about, you know, what should I do for my career when everything's so urgent? I think one of the things that that I had learned is, you know, when our son was was having all these surgeries and we were having to sleep at the hospital and he was he was in the PICU, which is like the NICU, but for older children, mm-hmm. and, you know, and all this stuff was happening. I was so adrenalized and so feeling like I have to do this. I have to be there every second. I'm the mom. I have to give up everything, my sleep, my la la la. At you know, at some point a friend came and said, you know, go take a nap. I was like, I can't take a nap. You know, I have to be awake for everything. You know, but you know, not only just human biology, you know, it's the whole, you know, you have to put on your own air mask at the in the plane crash before you can help others. It's not even just, you know, you have limits of biology. But to skip forward, let's say 10 years, when I first decided, well, you know what? I am actually a whole person. I am a mother, but my other primary, before I had Jason, my other primary identity was as a writer. And one of the things I used to do as a writer is go to artist colonies. Artist colonies are very interesting places because actually it's mostly people who don't have children, but you it's a, it's a fellowship situation that you apply to. And if you get such a fellowship, you go out somewhere. In fact, I am going to Wyoming in about two weeks where you stay at these beautiful places. People give you a studio. Um, they practice, they make you beautiful food. They practically put it in your mouth and you, all you're supposed to do is just create, create, create. And I had missed that. And I decided that if I could swing it, I was going to go back to that part of my old life. And I have to say, that has saved me. Going there for those two weeks, being by myself, just working on my work. Actually, literally, you know, I, I would Skype at night, but literally not. You know, I got to turn off my brain. I was physically away. That made me so much of a better mother. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I've heard so many women say that. And I, for me as well, it was very similar where, and and my son's still young. So he's five. You, yours right. is 19 now. So you have some wits to share here. Um, it has been difficult because I think um, in many cases we do lose ourselves trying to fill a gap um, that we think that just a little bit more time, a little bit more hugs, a little bit more, I don't know is going to make things better. It's going to save them. Right. Um, and in doing that, we end up losing ourselves. Um, and so, you know, finding that balance is definitely something that I think most working mothers are trying their best to do. Oh, absolutely. Especially ironically, after fearing the worst is going to happen, you know, in some ways the worst has happened, but that it's great. So that's why I find it so funny from the outside. So many people feel like you can't possibly be happy, you know, with this situation. This is every parent's worst nightmare. But then I just feel, no, you know, I have a child. This is my son. And I actually have a pretty nice life. I'm doing what I love. I'm a parent. And it's one of these weirdly hard won things where I appreciate it so much more than possibly if he were neurotypical. I would probably be, oh, he's going off to college and here we are. But I feel like now every minute that I am away from him, I I don't feel guilty, but it's extremely hard one. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, and I think that one of the things that you said earlier is that there's this connection with people who have experienced really traumatic and difficult situations. And I absolutely agree with you. I think there's two stages in which people see that. You you seem to have seen them early. One seems to be the introduction of life with birth, and the other one seems to be seeing somebody you love pass away. Um, And so it seems like for some people, they don't just, they don't get to experience it always um, until these two extremes happen. Um, And for some of them, it may be too late. So just like you, I think, you know, I certainly wouldn't have wished my birth on anyone, but I'm grateful for it for me. It's changed my life drastically. And because of it, I've been able to um, see things through a completely different lens. And I also got a chance to find and stalk (laughs) you. And (laughs) what has been amazing. So Marie, I'm grateful for you. uh, Grateful for the work that you're putting out there to keep us moving. And I'm grateful for the time you've given us in the Tote and Pairs podcast today. I'm Amber Anderson. Thanks again for listening to the Toten Pairs podcast. I'll be back in a couple of weeks to bring you a fresh perspective on women. In the meantime, go ahead and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel inclined to do so, we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a review or send us an email at hi at or catch us on social at Toten Pairs across the internet.